photographs, normal images, will often look like fireworks in the digraph. Um, and you, know, you can see the structure, which is very different from what it was uh, in for the in, in case of the text. Even if this were sore encoded or shifted in some way, the picture would look the same. It would just shift around in that view, uh, and that is the power of a simple visualization uh, primitive. So that's your you know antique lens number one. So here we're looking at three. The bottom left corner. I get it right. You can kind of you can start kind of seeing it. Um, so the bottom this on the uh, here this part is the the uh, digraph view. Off here to this side is the entropy view. Uh, yes. On the entropy view, how did you scale that? Did you get one entropy reading per line? it's one entropy reading per line. So and and right now it's fixed to the default. Um, so here. It, it comes out at 640 by 480 in the byte plot view. So each line of this uh, byte plot equates to the, the location of the entropy. Yep. If you resize this, the byte plot view, the entropy doesn't resize along with it. Yeah. For entropy, you need a distribution. So you just decide on the window in which you take that distribution. And, and yeah, I mean, there are many ways you could do it. You could add tuning knobs to all of these things. But then as you go through the file, you can see that this, you know, the changes as you go. And again, this is just one example. But what we found, we've looked at a lot of examples, and what we're showing you are things that we've seen appear time and time again. Uh, so we're not suggesting these weird one-off examples, unless we tell you it's a weird one-off example. Yeah. Uh, here's a weird one-off example. Uh, to the left is, uh, yeah, to the left is a picture, and it, uh, inside that picture, in the two least significant bytes, is another picture. All right, so of a cat, and all cats are named Mr. Jingles, so that's Mr. Jingles. Um, and here's the view. So what do you notice about it? Actually, let me make it bigger. Okay, you can see something weird going on here. So for the person who asked the steg question, you know, it, it, manipulating lower order bits, if you've got two levels of things, yeah, it, it may very well show up. It depends on, again, it depends how much you're putting in there and how similar the things are, but it, you've got a good chance. Yeah, so it's a familiar beak, but it also is something else. It can probably open beer bottles. And there's, um, and, but there's many different image formats. So there's, there's, many, there's a great deal of depth as you think through this of ways images can be, if you want to identify them programmatically, for example, or try to, there's different ways they're encoded. So you have to think those through. Uh, audio is another good example. Again, it can be compressed, but it, could, it has to be uncompressed at some point to actually uh, typically be used. So here's an example. This is uh, a WAV file. Uh, notice the U-shaped, the very distinct high and low bytes for a WAV file. And this is a, um, a 44 kilohertz, 16-bit per channel PCM encoded audio. Um, and here, the digraph is very distinct. And this is Sweet Home Alabama. And sadly, when you press the play button on this, it doesn't actually play the song. Uh, okay, so you can see there is structure. It's a different structure. You know, you're not gonna get a picture emerge. Uh, but, and then the entropy does change, but I'm gonna hit play here. And actually, I'll probably speed this up. See, it changes pretty significantly as you go through. So the idea is with these insights, how can you programmatically identify these things? Now we know the digraph has that characteristic. And you can see the entropy as well. Now these are pure fragments, so we're not looking at mix, we're looking at individual primitive types here, essentially. But you, you could take a sample out of a larger file and quickly categorize those samples, even if the file were, for example, XORD. Yes, or, or the, 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 um, the BinViz tool will allow you, you can just slide to that offset and take a look. Uh, compressed audio, and this is a theme you're going to see again and again, um, compressed audio and encrypted and random numbers typically exhibit very little structure as, they, as they're intended. But if you think about the nature of each of those ca uh, categories, compression typically wants to be reversed, right? It's a, it's a reversible process. Um, encryption wasn't designed to be a random number generator. 
So there are perhaps some statistical characteristics that distinguish it from, um, from random numbers themselves. And just taking a look now at this MP3, there is some structure there. Um, and the, looking at it, and this is a, a view I just want to touch on briefly. It's a, a, Dan Kaminsky used it. It's called the dot plot. Uh, the link to the original paper, and then uh, Dan Kaminsky's talk there. But the basic idea is it's a measure of self-similarity, a measure of structure within a file. And if you take a sequence of, of values, byte values or words, here to be or not to be, and you plot them on the horizontal and vertical axes. Where they coincide, where two appears in, you know, the same word appears on both axes, you plot a point. That's the basic idea. So just like the digraphs are a measure of a bigrams, this is a measure of self-similarity. And this is the MP3. And you see there is structure in there. You might not notice with the, vis the with eye. You almost certainly won't recognize it with a hex editor, uh, or you might not. So anyway, these are just, again, once you've found that, you say, well, what caused that? And you can kind of narrow it down and then maybe find a way to use that to your advantage. Uh, video is essentially sequence, uh, uncompressed video, full frame video, uh, just uh, is, uh, the AVI format's just image after image, like a flip book. Uh, compressed images uh, often will have a keyframe, which is uh, the, a full frame, and then uh, a so followed by some sequence of frames that just show the difference followed by the keyframe. So this is just looking inside a compressed AVI. And it, it, again, it's useful to see these pictures so as you're looking at these things, you can't really tell this from a hex editor. Um, Windows PE file. Uh, now this, we won't say there, it's the same primitive type in there. I mean, if you look at the text region, at the bottom there's a, you know, a table of strings. So mixed with the code at the top. So the text at the top is what code looks like typically. And then the, in the resource section, our SRC section, has you know, bitmaps and other different types of structure embedded. So there, but it's useful to, I thought it'd be interesting to actually see what you know, the sections looked like because you spend a lot of your time in those sections. And then looking at this command.exe as well. So now looking specifically at machine code, uh, we looked at a lot, and we have some statistical analyses at the end. This is just one example. Uh, but you get a, a histogram or a digraph plot that looks kind of like a grid. So if you're going through this file and you see that grid appear, that, that tells you that it may be machine code because we found that there's not all that many common primitive types out there that you, once you get a handle of what they look like, you can start identifying them on the fly. This is the ever popular calc.exe, probably the most analyzed program in the world. Okay, so at the top, um, so as we play this, note, um, so this is the grid that I was discussing. You'll see that grid, and the t this top part, the top half of the file is essentially all grid. And you can see that's what it looks like. And then as you transition, you'll see it, give, it, it popped briefly and when it hit strings. Yeah, by the way, you just saw a piece of, uh, a piece of text, which is the uh, right yes, there. Which so is right, that's, string table. that's the string table. And then you get into the images that look like fireworks, right? So you get the fireworks kind of at the end. You'll all, and this is, an, as we said, bitmaps could be anything. Data structures, typically you know them when you see them. Uh, oftentimes they'll be blanks, the, uh, they have a great deal of structure, pardon, pardon the pun. But uh, they're visually very recognizable, but they could theoretically contain, you know, random numbers. <laughs> so they kind of, but in common practice they look like this. So what are the statistical signatures like? Is there a way that you can pull out data structures? And as you'll note that we're, we're, we're not talking about knowing a priori the um, file format in advance. The, um, or, or any, we're not assuming any knowledge. You could combine that with certain knowledge if you know a file format, what's it, what should be expected at a given spot. But we're not assuming that. And again, random numbers look like random numbers. Uh, the flip side of random numbers, padding, repeating values and the like uh, are, are again very easy. But you do see that. So we included that in our thinking about this problem. 
Um, and then there's the idea of transformation. So we've largely looked at the kind of the raw, the base primitive types, but they can undergo many, many transformations. Some uh, encryption, compression, encoding being the most common. And if you think about an image, an image on a camera, maybe an uncompressed image, a TIFF file or, or something like that, and you load it onto your computer, you load into image editor, you edit it, you save it as a compressed version. That compressed version may be sent over you know, a protocol that uses encoding, text encoding. So these transformations occur. When that, when that uh, compressed image is loaded into memory, it's uncompressed. So the, it's going to, you're, what, one thing we'll like at different points in this game will be different. But oftentimes the, you can find some signatures will often pop through. So this is just a, a Windows PE file that's base64 encoded and you can see the, the text region at the top still is visual, uh, visible. And also the, uh, the, the vertical lines there, are, are, it, you, uh, you see that as a common um, artifact within base64 encoded files. Um, sometimes other artifacts like this, this chunk here, I, I drew diagonal lines on the top and then there's a, a mirror image on the bottom, that there may be artifacts in there that you didn't know and that you can use to your advantage. Uh, UP, well, this is a UPX file, I think a compressed file, I think it's cmd.exe. And at the top though, it, it by default it only compressed the, uh, the code region and the other structures there. So you can see a kind of um, certain times structure pops through. And this code would not look like the code in the uh, byte plot. Yeah, it would look like a compressed, more like the, the white noise, the star field kind yes. of look. Uh, and then encrypted looks a lot like random. Um, and then it's also useful to think in terms of um, the obfuscation techniques people will do within their code. And there's a wide variety people can use. We've chosen just a couple of examples to illustrate. Uh, if you, uh, you know, adding and subtracting a constant, at, at looking at a hex editor, you know, things will look, look different, right? But uh, other properties shine through with the right magnifying glass, the right window. So here's one that we've shifted each by 150 and wrapped around if it exceeded 255. Um, and by adding a constant, it's, it's useful to think of that as a shift cipher, right? That uh, you're just shifting two alphabets side by side. But in the frequency distribution still in the same order, it's just slid and uh, it, you've just shifted it. And the same thing, like XORing a file, uh, XORing a value. So you've got a key, a randomly chosen key that you're XORing with the, every value, 8 bit XOR, um, yields a set of, of values. And, but depending on the key you choose, uh, it can, there can be any mapping between the plane and cipher. So this 8 bit key is really the equivalent of a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. But still, structure pops through that because even with a limited, well, a limited number with one key like that, it, there's a reason why one time pads have an infinite uh, or have a, a key applied, a random value XOR with every value in a file because otherwise structure pops through. So anyway, thinking from 8-bit uh, XOR to 16-bit XOR, you, you have um, eight, 16 bits. So the first eight bits is key one applied to byte one. And applied to the second eight goes to byte two and then you reuse the keys. And essentially what you've got is a two alphabet polyalphabetic, uh, poly, um, poly, I'm losing my mind. Yeah, there. one of those. Yeah, polyalphabetic. Uh, so you've got a two alphabet polyalphabetic cipher. And if you've done a 32 bit XOR, you have four bytes, essentially, and you keep using, or four keys, and you're reusing those. So essentially, you have four alphabets. So what you'll see on the diagram, for example, is that you're, you'll be seeing double or quadruple of the usual picture. But it will still be the usual picture because neither of those methods actually destroys your bigrams. It transforms them, makes them into different bigrams, but does not destroy them entirely. Demo? Sure. Um, and then as I mentioned before that if your number of keys uh, go all the way up to the, match the number of bytes, if you're, then you hit uh, a one-time pad. So what you're talking about, those, those values become more and more diffused as you increase the, the size of the key. And I think, so demo time. So let's see that. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you what these are, so you have to tell me what they are. Okay. 
So the byte plot, what does that look like? It looks kind of text-like, okay. And I'll get, uh, th so that is correct. And then if you f adjust the size, you get lined up, right? What do you see in the middle? Yeah, you can see vertical bar. 